All right, so microservices, you can't hear me? It's on, it's just, I have a huge head. Okay, so microservices, Wildfly Swarm, and how we can play a part in it. So first of all, I'm Bob McWhorter. I'm one of the co-leads for Wildfly Swarm, and I'm a founder of the Code House, Drools, Groovy, Torquebox. <clears throat> so microservices, they're hot, obviously. We're talking about a lot of microservices here. And the promises of microservices are kind of trifold. We're looking at how to help define your architecture where things can have independent release cycles. And all of this leads to accelerating business velocity so your business can do the work of your business faster. But all of this requires discipline. One of the big things that you gotta be disciplined about is bounded context. And what this means is that each service does one thing, it does it really well. And in the old school way of doing things, we used to call this a library. But if it was a library, it's probably now a service. I like this picture because the service is a black box. It has well-defined inputs and well-defined outputs, and you just wire all these things together. Sounds simple, but. Another thing we have to be disciplined about is loose coupling. And that means your implementations are loosely coupled. You can't worry about the details of each implementation because you have your well-defined inputs and outputs. That's your API now, probably over the network. And loosely coupled in terms of location. You never know where your service is going to be running. You don't know how many you're going to have. You don't know where to find them. So we have to make this more dynamic. But all this leads us to Conway's Law. Conway's Law states that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce systems which are copies of their own organization. Basically, a monolithic organization produces monolithic software. Okay, so we take that. How do we solve that? We use the two pizza rule. The two pizza rule says that any team should be feedable with two pizzas. So that means I'm on a team by myself because I'm a large guy. But most teams should be less than eight people. And that includes the product manager. So we're not talking about eight engineers plus another four QE and two PMs and a couple of marketing guys. You gotta have small focused teams. And when we have to be this small and focused, we can look at the example from the micro profile we've all been talking about this week. And these are the, the services that we have created. These are the services that we have created um, within MicroProfile to demonstrate the whole thing. We have a service for sessions. We have a service for speakers. We have a service for schedules. We have a service for votes. So these are abounded contexts. But also when you're doing microservices, you've got to worry about more than that. Things like security and logging, discovery, monitoring. But before we dive too far into microservices, we have some caveats. If you failed at SOA, you're probably going to fail at microservices. If you failed at SOA, you're probably going to fail at microservices. If you failed at SOA, you're probably going to fail at microservices. It takes a lot of discipline, and you can't just magically apply microservices and make it work. Because really, monthly, weekly, hourly releases, they're not easy. Not if you're doing 200 of them every hour, or every week, or every month. But there are things that can help you when you're attacking microservices. Containers. I stick it in quotes because containers are things like Linux containers, such as Docker, and even Uber jars, which is kind of a Java version of a container, everything all together. And we like containers because whatever is tested is exactly what should go into production. Because if it's not, you're building up entropy as you go from development to test to production. And entropy is where things can fall apart. But okay, how do I move this stuff from what I've built to being in production? We recommend CI, CD pipelines. Continuous integration, continuous deployment. Because if you're deploying continuously, you should be building continuously. Everything should be nonstop. And cloud. It doesn't have to be public cloud. It could be private cloud. It could be OpenShift on-premise. It could be hosted OpenShift. It could be host, uh, OpenShift anywhere. It could be not OpenShift but we recommend OpenShift. Because if you're deploying a lot of things continuously, automated provisioning is very, very useful. You don't want to have to email the IT staff to go set up a machine 40 times a day. Plus, things like OpenShift provide cross-cutting functionality, such as service discovery, failover, logging, monitoring, and the provisioning we just mentioned. And so you hook all this up on your CICD pipeline, and these are like layers of an onion are layers of your cloud. You move things from your CI server, which is where your developers push to to see did you break stuff, 
moving on into QE, to staging, into prod. And what's moving through here are containers. It could be Docker containers, it could be Uber jars, but some single artifact so that you know what's in stage one is the same thing that's in stage four. So that's a line of hand waving. I actually want to write a microservice. So how do I do that? Well, first, you do not have to move to Node.js just because you're doing microservices. You don't even have to move to something that's reactive, like Vertex, but it might be useful. Depends on the problem you're solving. And let's say you're a Java EE developer as old as me, 40 some odd years old. You know, I'm not going to go learn Rust and Go this week. I'm just not going to do it. So that's where we bring in Wildfly Swarm. Wildfly Swarm is just like Wildfly, but swarmier. So what, what does that actually mean? We, uh, Wildfly Swarm allows us to take the bits of the application server that you need, wrap them up with your application, and treat it as a single artifact that can be deployed. So you don't have to bring all the extra bits of the app server you don't need. You can still use all the Java EE APIs and more that you want to use. And we stick it all together in a single jar that you copy around. So if you're building something with a JSON API, really, do you need EJB? Do you need JSF? No, you don't. So like I said, it allows us to wrap the app server around your app and chop off the pieces you don't need. I love my black boxes. So here, you have a war file. You wrote a war file a year ago, right? Simple service. It does JSON, JAXRS. You run it through Wildfly Swarm. You get your same app back, but a dash swarm dot jar, which you can now just execute. It's your artifact. And then if you want to, drop that on a Linux container, such as uh, Docker. All right, so that, that's hand waving in black boxes. So here's a warning. We're going to show a little maven. You may wish to cover your eyes. We have a plugin. You add this to your existing war project. You know, it's already building a war file. You add our plugin to it. You run this package goal. And you get a swarm jar out of that. That's all you have to do in the simplest case, because we will actually analyze your application we will notice you're using JAXRS, and you're using JMS, and that you're doing some EJBs. So we, we grab those bits and pieces and stick them around your application for you. We figure it out. So I said JAXRS a lot, but we actually support quite a few things. You know, plain servlets, JAXRS, JMS, CDI, uh, batch, JPA, security, transactions, naming, bean validation, resource adapters, JavaFX, JMX, and we can detect most of these things for you and just stick it into your, your application. But if we can't do that, or you wish to have more control and be explicit about what you're bringing into your app so you know for sure what's going in, you can also just start using dependencies that we hope are well named. So we have our org wildfly swarm group ID, and the artifact IDs pretty much match the spec, the spec that we support, JAXRS, JMX, whatever. Notice we don't specify a version because we ship bombs. Bombs are our way of bringing in all these pieces to you and making them easy for you to consume. But we realize we're always building stuff, and some of our stuff is stable, some of our stuff is not stable, some of our stuff might be deprecated someday. So instead of just importing bomb, which is all of our recommended stable things, we provide other bombs you can choose to import. If you like to live on the edge, you can start bringing in bomb-experimental, and that makes a whole lot more artifacts visible to your build. But if you only bring in bomb, if we've marked it as experimental, it's not available to you. Your build will fail. You know, I can't find the artifact. They don't have a version for it. So we've talked about wrapping the app server around your app, but then how do I configure that? Because my app server has a lot of configuration. You know, I don't just use the app server and put my app in there. I like to tweak it and tune it. So if you're already used to Wildfly, like I said, we're Wildfly, but swarmier, that means we can still eat your standalone XML. You, you, you've handcrafted this, this perfect standalone XML that defines your data sources, your, your JMS endpoints, your InfiniSpan configuration for your caches. You don't have to rethink that. Just give us that standalone XML. We will eat that when we run your app. And you can stick it on your, inside your app, on your class path, wherever you want to stick it. Reference it by a file or URL. And we'll configure the app server of Wildfly just like that, even though we've swarmified your whole app. I don't like XML because it's pointy and pokes me in the eye. So we've also created a Java API that mirrors everything you can do in standalone XML. So if you want to programmatically configure the app server through your own main, you can. Here's an example. This is how, you, if you have your own main and you really want to own the app server, you create a new swarm, 
we've put every little bit of functionality in what we call a fraction. You can configure those however you like. We have helper methods like the create debug logging fraction. Gives you debug enabled for every logging category possible. And then we use JAX or, or we use um, shrink wrap, which allows you to programmatically also create deployments. So you can deploy multiple things, picking and choosing classes from your app to create a different deployment using shrink wrap and deploy it. You can deploy multiple things here. Okay, maybe I don't want to go so far as to write Java code, but I also don't want to write XML. Well, we support properties and YAML to do a lot of this configuration. Because a lot of things, you know, configuring a data source is a stanza of XML or a stanza of Java. But really, it's a URL. It's a host name, maybe. It's a username and a password. We can set all that through properties. We can set all that through YAML files. And so we support this file called projectstages.yaml. We auto-locate it on your class path inside your app. You can sell, tell us what stage you're running in. You can say, I'm running in QE or production or any arbitrary name. The first half is all the defaults. If, if you otherwise not specified, you get the top ones. If I say I'm running in stage of production, these override down here. Changes my JDBC connection URL. Okay, so so far I've basically talked about Java EE that gives you an app server wrapped around it. What about the actually microservice-y stuff? All right, I'm, I'm running it in the cloud, I'm running it on OpenShift, I have it Dockerized, but I have 200 of these things. I need to log. Okay, we make it easy. All you have to do is include our log stash dependency, set two properties or two entries in your YAML file, and now anytime you launch this thing, it will reach out and connect to log stash and start dropping your log messages on it. Then you can use Kibana or whatever and view those things. All right, I have my microservices. I, I want them secure, you know? So we like Keycloak. It's our single sign-on server. It uses OAuth 2. It's from Red Hat SSO is the product that we sell based on that. You can include this dependency, get the keycloak.json from your server, put it in there, and then you can very easily secure every deployment, every microservice, and say, you know, I want to protect this microservice, I require that you're authenticated and have certain roles, and this thing will double check all the uh, cryptographic signatures of the JSON web tokens that might be flowing in from your UI, and we make it easy. One dependency, bring one file over, and now your service is, is secure. We also deal with discovery, because that was one of the things you have to worry about with these things. You have 200 of them, how do I find them? We have this concept of topology, which is how do my services find all the other services running in the constellation? We support jgroups, which is the normal wildfly way of finding its neighbors. We support OpenShift using Kubernetes to find where are my neighbors there, you know, where are these things running. We don't have to know, we can ask Kubernetes. We support HashiCorp's console registry, which is when a service comes up, it goes to a central registry, registers itself, says I'm over here, port 9090 or whatever, and other folks can go look it up. And then we integrate this stuff with Netflix Ribbon. So if you're using Ribbon to do client-side load balancing, it's topology aware, and you say, I just want to call the service named Bob, and our topology comes up with an ordered list of these things that you can round robin through or whatever load balancing strategy you want to use using normal Ribbon mechanisms. So the bottom line, from my point of view, being a 40-year-old Java developer, is that Java EE is a perfectly acceptable way to write microservices. And given the things we've done with Wildfly Swarm, I think it's an awesomely fantastic way to write microservices. And from the announcements that we've seen here this week, I think Micro Profile is going to make this really easy and make it portable so you're not locking your way itself into any particular vendor. Because if you turn around, don't do it right now, there's my IBM and they have their Micro Profile sign. And there are a couple of other vendors here, Tommy Tribe, and we're all pitching in trying to make Java, enterprise Java work well for microservices. And Wildfly Swarm is our way of doing that. And if you just want to use MicroProfile, and you, you just say, I want to use MicroProfile, add this dependency, and you now get this version of Swarm that supports CDI, JAXRS, JSONP. Or just auto-detect. Just write a, an app that is compliant to MicroProfile. Only use those APIs that are in MicroProfile. Like I showed in the very beginning, add our plugin, and we'll build a MicroProfile app for you. Right now, MicroProfile 1.0 includes this. We had a meeting two days ago where we're trying to define what MicroProfile 1.1 or 2.0 might look like. Is this list is going to grow, and it's going to go not just bringing in more of Java EE, it's going to go beyond that. It's going to solve problems that Java EE has not solved that we face in the microservices world. 
So that's 70 slides in 15 minutes, my personal best, I believe. But here are the resources. We have Wildfly Swarm, we are open source, Apache licensed, we're on GitHub. Uh, we have a whole repository full of examples that show you how to do all sorts of things using auto detection or writing your main file or using YAML files and standalone XMLs. We have a website. We hang out on IRC because as mentioned, I'm 40. I like IRC. I don't know what Slack is. It's apparently the new hipster IRC. Um, we maintain issues on Jira and we have a Google group. So if you have any questions, find the tall guy, that's me, or the Australian guy, that's the one over there who sounds Australian. We'll be glad to talk to you. And if you'd like to hear the same talk again, slightly slower, I'm doing it tomorrow, I think at 11.30. Thank you.